Hello. I think uh, we're on the air. Hi, and welcome to this Google Hangout with HBR. I'm Scott Bernardo. I'm a senior editor here at HBR. I'm uh, joined by Sandy Patland, um, friend of HBR, Toshiba Professor of Media, Arts, and Sciences at MIT. He's also the author of this book that I recommend to everyone called Social Physics, How Good Ideas Spread. And he's featured in the November issue of HBR in this cover feature called The Internet of Everything. We're spending quite a bit of time talking about uh, the Internet of Things these days, and we're going to be spending a lot of time over the next month on HBR.org talking about the Internet of Things. Everybody's excited about the Internet of Things, um, but Sandy has wants to pump the brakes a little bit on the hype, and we're here to talk about privacy and security and data sharing. So welcome, and thanks for joining us, Sandy. Thank you. Glad to be here. All right, so let's just start and talk about how real the Internet thing of Things is. I mean, this is a real thing now, right? There's real applications, and people are really using this thing. Yeah, well, you know, certainly people are doing a lot of Internet of Things internally to companies to monitor things, but I'm uh, re reminded of uh, an award we got. Uh, we started a company about five years ago uh, that was tracking taxis so that you could get better rides. You would know where to pick up a taxi. Uh, and that won a New York Times 10 best Internet of Things application. The things were people, of course, right? So you need to count cell phones and Fitbits and things like that as part of the Internet of Things. And when you do, you realize the Internet of Things already includes almost all of humanity and all of the traffic lights and increasingly all of the cars and credit cards and and all of that data now is out there and beginning to be used. The spotlight in the November issue starts with two really foundational articles about how this thing, this sen you know, network of sensors and devices that talk to each other, is already having a profound effect in manufacturing, in healthcare. Um, there's some consumer applications already. And then the third piece is my Q&A with you, where we, we pump the brakes a little bit on, the, on this. And, and you're concerned that some of the privacy and security implications of this network could sort of have a really deleterious effect if we don't take them head on. So you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, you know, our culture, the culture is worldwide and grown up with a certain idea about privacy. And privacy is important because you don't want the government spying on you. You don't want companies, you know, knowing exactly when you go to the bathroom so that they can do something. You know, there's a lot of sort of stuff that is not only inconvenient, but frankly, uh, a little scary. And so we need a little space just to be by ourselves, be with our families, and not subjected to uh, scrutiny. And so that's what privacy is about. And with the new Internet of Things, you're potentially under the spotlight constantly. And that means that bad guys or people who are a little overzealous um, can get in there and know precisely when you went to breakfast, watch you moving around in your house. Like I remember at Davos, the, the founder of Nest, which Google bought, gave a talk about, you know, smart thermostats that know what room you're in. And, and the audience was aghast and just about lynched him because they said, Google is going to know when I'm in the bathroom? And the answer was yes. And <laughs> He tried to say, well, but, you know, we'll protect it. And, and they were just going to have none of that. The whole idea that, you know, you're not free to do what you want in your house was just absolutely against their uh, value system. And so those sort of things we're up against. Um, we have to come up with a society where we have independent people still. You're not constantly on stage. And yet we want the efficiency and new capabilities that the Internet of Things brings. And your concern would be, you know, if, if enough bad things happen or these sort of nest examples crop up in practice, then people are going to say, well, just shut this Internet of Things down or let's regulate it into the ground. And then all of those good things sort of aren't available to us, all the good things that that network can produce. Right. And that's beginning to happen. I mean, you see reactions, the uh, court decisions in Europe particularly, um, that uh, are really, really extensive in terms of shutting down this sort of stuff. 
you see countries requiring that the internet stop at their borders, the data not leave the country. And those are all things that are breaking up the glorious thing that has happened uh, with the internet, with data, and a lot of the positive things will go away with that too. For instance, recently the UN Secretary General uh, put me on a uh, council about the data revolution. Because if you think about developing countries, about poor communities, data that lets you know about health and transportation and medical things will save millions of lives and untold and so So we don't want all of that stuff to go away. And as a consequence, we have to think about how are we going to deal with this right now. We have to set the template so that people in Germany calm down, so that people in Liberia can track Ebola, so that uh, we can have the sort of respectful society that we want, while at the same time having the new services and better productivity. And so you've actually made a proposal, I think you, you started it at Davos, uh, to deal with all of these hard questions, and you call it the New Deal on Data. Do you want to talk a little bit about what that New Deal on Data is? Yeah, so I was concerned about this enough that about six years ago I started a discussion at Davos between um, the CEOs of major multinational companies, the chief regulators, the head of the Federal Trade Commission, Justice Commissioner of the EU, people like that, about what are we going to do. The first, of course, is to get them to appreciate the problem and the dangers, and then to be able to think about what would be a win-win-win solution, win for companies, win for governments, win for the citizens that could do that. And out of that came this new deal on data. And the new deal on data, the core of it is very simple. It's really giving people more rights to control data that's about themselves. So that if somebody's collecting data about you, you can turn it off, but also you can say what they can and can't do with it. Um, and the legal phrase of it is you give people the rights of ownership in data. Not actual ownership, but the right to say where the data is going to go, the right to retract it back when you're not happy, the, the right to cut a deal so that if some company is making money off of it, maybe you could get part of that too. Um, so it, it's basically bringing people to the table in this Internet of Things world where people aren't just you know, little automatons or ants or serfs. They're actually equal partners. And when people are equal partners, then we can begin to find something, a solution that is satisfactory for companies, for governments, and for people. But unless the people are at the table, it's just going to be violent politics. As you're talking, I'm imagining people at companies like Google, you know, with Jones Nest and others, doing Internet of Things applications, um, blanching because a lot of these businesses rest on the concept that they need to collect that data to make those businesses go. And so, how do you respond to those people who say, you know, by controlling the data, you're actually tamping down innovation. You're not letting us develop these applications the way we need to. We need all that data. Well, so <laughs> Google's a good example because Google actually doesn't resell data to other people. So they have a fairly straightforward value proposition. You know, look at my data and give me services in return based on what you see that I would like. <laughs> and most people buy into that. It seems like a reasonable proposition for them. So, so having the new deal on data doesn't really change Google's life all that much. On the other hand, there's a lot of companies that collect data and then resell it without you even knowing. And those companies are going to have a real hard time. And as a consequence of these Davos discussions and other things, you know, the regulators are now gunning for those companies. So you know, they had better find a new way to exist anyhow. And the thing they need to do is be respectful of the customers, involve them in the dialogue. In many ways, that's great, because then what you get is you get customers who have greater loyalty. That's really what we're talking about, is having them much more involved in what's going on. Creating that symmetry, though, 
and we've talked about this before, where people now know what you're doing with the data, what you're collecting. Sometimes people say, whoa, you know, put the brakes on. I don't want you knowing that about me. Do you think there's any fear on companies' parts that by engaging in a new deal on data type of agreement with their customers, they're actually going to lose their business because suddenly customers realize, actually, I didn't know you were tracking the position of my car. I didn't know you knew which room <laughs> yeah. uh, of the house I'm in, so, at least from a consumer's perspective. Well, there's a lot of paranoia about that. But um, I think a lot of traditional companies, a lot of the big companies, really aren't doing much that people would be uh, objecting to. So they don't have that much to fear. What they have to do is change their mindset. Instead of them unilaterally deciding what to do with the data, customer be damned, uh, what they need to do is they need to have much more of a engagement with the customer. And what's interesting is, is when you engage the customer, you can get lots more data, be very valuable data. If, for instance, people are more than willing to contribute all of their purchase data at supermarkets because they know the supermarkets are doing something with that that benefits them. Customers are not, by and large, crazy people. They're willing to trade data for service. You just have to have a good value proposition. So one of my favorite things about working with you is always that you have these big ideas, but then you go out and test them, and then you have data. And you actually have been testing the New Deal on data. Can you talk a little bit about that test and what it's yielded? Sure. So um, working with Telecom Italia and Telefonica, um, what we did is we set up a, a, a test bed in Trento with the university there. And what in that area, what you can do is you can sign up to be able to see and control all the data that the telephone company and the local co-op and the city knows about you. So you really have this new deal on data. Not only is there transparency, but there's much more opt-in, much more control. And what you find is people are much more willing to share data because it's not some spooky thing that they don't understand. They can see it, and because the offers actually offer them some value. So if you can share data anonymously and you know it only goes so far, then you would be willing to share things like your financial records so that you could compare yourself to other people. Or folks, so people do that. They're actually really, really happy to do that. Or share where your children are so that your children can meet up with other families with young children. You'd never do that on the internet, but if you feel that the data sharing is under your control and is relatively safe, it turns out people are just really happy to do that because they're getting value and, and they feel the trust. Do you think that can scale? That's sort of that's one village in Italy. Do you think the, the idea can scale to a massive level? Well, we know that um, you know the software that implements this is something that we've had real experts at. It, people who have built systems that serve hundreds of millions of people constantly and. Their judgment is, is that, yes, this can scale without any real problem in terms of the actual system. Uh, what needs to happen, of course, is that some of the big players, the, the telcos, the banks, maybe the Googles of the world, um, need to begin engaging their customers and offering them the same sort of things that we're doing in Trento. And incidentally, we're doing the same sorts of things now at Mass General Hospital, so around health records here at MIT around um, how does the organization run or have an agreement with Luxembourg to look at banking things and can we actually do more there. So, you know, it's beginning to take off. It, we've seen nothing that says it isn't scalable. Uh, and so I'm relatively hopeful. The difference between, you know, the Google value proposition, which is, you know, you share data about your search habits and we target ads and s something like that, and when you get into the Internet of Things, which oftentimes gets sort of more personal and more close to the self, is yep. pretty profound. So I I'm assuming that the value proposition of collecting data about me, maybe, you know, those fitness tracking apps and things like that, collecting data about me, myself, my vitals, where I am in my house, all of that, you're going to have to have a more compelling value proposition than, you know, targeted ads or something like that. Do you get that sense? Oh, absolutely. Um, 
you know, what I think is is that people are going to ask, well, why do you need this data and not, like, when do you know, why do you need to know when I go in the bathroom or the kitchen? Can't you just have some energy efficiency thing that you send back, right? And, and you have to have a good answer for that. But what people do also want to do is compare themselves to other people. So one of the things we do in Italy is we provide a more trusted platform so that I can, for instance, um, ask, do I spend as much time in the kitchen as my neighbors do? And what will happen is data about my kitchen work is anonymized and compared and shared with other people who want to share. And now I can get answers to that. Now, that may not be the most compelling thing, but you can also do it with credit card records. People love that. You know, do yep. your neighbors spend as much on cars as I do? <laughs> they spend as much on shoes as I do? Those are questions that people really care about. Right. Uh, we have some questions coming in. I'd love to uh, get some uh, audience participation going. So I'm going to uh, read off some of these questions that are, that are coming in uh, over on the side of my screen here. Um, why don't more companies offer a value proposition for the customer to incentivize them to allow uh, allow using their data for marketing? We actually just sort of addressed that, didn't we? <laughs> I picked the wrong well, one. But go I ahead. Mean, and I mean, there is an answer, and the answer is data is very new to most co uh, companies. They don't know how to do it in terms of accounting. There's a big thing in the newspaper just recently about that. They don't know how to deal with it in terms of management. And they don't know how to deal with it in terms of customers. And what I'm saying is, is data is a, a point at which you can engage the customer where they'll be interested because it's often data about them. Should they treat it more like an asset or currency than they do? Well, it's an asset, I think. It's, it's something that's valuable to the company. It's valuable to the person. Um, so in that sense, it's a little bit like money. Uh, it, it, of course, it's different in many other ways, too. But one of the important things is that, you know, you don't put your money someplace where you where it just goes off by itself and you don't know what happened to it. You shouldn't do the same thing with data. Data, you should know what's happening to your data, and you should be able to audit it, just like with your money, so that you can cut deals, so that you can get value from data that you generate. Here's a, another good uh, one uh, asking with regulation with regards to the Internet of Things. Of what, what would you consider a priority? If you had to prioritize some of the regulation that we need to govern the Internet of Things, what would you prioritize? Well, I'm particularly interested in having people have informed consent, in other words, transparency about what's happening, and that they're able to agree to it, and then retract that agreement later easily not some you know terms and conditions that you can't understand and you can't use the facility you know if you don't agree to it I mean there's a lot of stuff that's really bogus now and so I think that's probably the biggest priority and then the second thing is auditing I mean are they doing what they say they're gonna do you don't really know now do you Actually, as you were saying that, uh, somebody came in and asked, can you give an example of informed consent around data use? Sure. Um, so an example I was asked about recently is in uh, uh, loans. So when I buy a car, um, I don't get a loan from the company that made the car. There's a separate company, a bank, that has an arm's length relationship with them that asks, well, did I earn enough money? You know, um, have I got a good credit rating? You know, et cetera. And, and the informed consent part is this, is that they tell me the interest rate. They tell me my credit score. If I ask, they'll tell me why I have that credit score. They'll give me a credit report. And I can dispute those things if I want to to get the car loan. Um, and actually, it's easier than disputing it with a, the with a credit report people because they, they'd like you to take the loan. They want to sell the car. So it was a very transparent process. They said, here's the things we're using. Here's the data that we have. Tell me if it's all okay. And if it is, here's your interest rate, and this is what you'll really pay. I thought that was wonderful. I knew exactly what was happening. 
you know, in the, in the spotlight, uh, the Michael Porter article that kicks off the spotlight talks a lot about manufacturing and business to business Internet of Things applications. And I'm wondering if you think the same sorts of rules need to apply in a business to business setting. Does company A need to know what company B is doing on the supply chain uh, with the data that's being collected, and should there be auditing of that kind of thing? Well, I think companies would like to know what happens to data that they share. It would make them a lot more willing to share data, uh, which would result in much more efficient processes. So today you don't reveal things because you don't know what's going to happen. If you could actually reveal something about your logistics chain, and know that it was only going to be used to optimize, you know, your the logistics chain that varies with yours. That would be wonderful. You could get all sorts of stuff done. So this notion of controlled permissions about sharing data and auditing of it, auditing of data uh, could really have a tremendous effect in the industry as well. I just want to uh, address one question that came in uh, here about getting this video after the fact, and yes, it will be available afterwards on YouTube, so, uh, and we'll uh, actually share that link on Facebook and Twitter as well. Cool. So, um, yeah. <laughs> um, so another question came in, uh, in terms of the Internet of Things and this data collection, what rules and jobs and skills are going to be needed in the next five years that we don't have today to make all this happen and to make a new deal-like infrastructure possible? Well, I think that uh, a good way to think about it is is that this is l the same type of uh, architecture, worldwide architecture, that you have for commodities, like for buying and selling gold or iron or, or oats. Uh, and it's similar to the thing that you have for, uh, for cash, where things are held, they're securitized, uh, they're traded, there's prices posted, there's a lot of transparency and auditing. If you look at all of the pieces, they look a lot like any of the markets that we have in other assets. And I think that there are obviously differences, the difference being that if you let data escape, it can be replicated for free. If you let gold escape, it doesn't multiply <laughs> endlessly, unfortunately, or maybe <laughs> fortunately. Um, but that just means that the auditing and the permissions need to be really uh, world class the way they are with cash. After all, cash today is just strings of ones and zeros, and people could I, theoretically replicate it endlessly, but you can't because of these architectures, software architectures that go around it. So I think those are the sorts of things that are going to be um, really important, along with, of course, the whole architecture for using data. How do you actually interpret it? How do you use it? How do you build it into manufacturing, into logistics, into sales, into insurance, into security? Um, those are all things that are just beginning to uh, get worked out. I know you, you came up with this idea for the New Deal as sort of a preemptive strike, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. But ultimately, are you optimistic about uh, our ability to do this the right way? Yeah, I think that... Um, we're at a critical point. Um, if it goes too far down the wrong path, it'll be very hard to pull back. Currently, most of the big regulated industries, so that's things like finance, telcos, uh, health industry, government, um, haven't done a whole lot in this area. They're just getting their toes wet. And so there's time to actually put regulation and architectures and and a new way of doing things into place. The only people that have gone a long way down it tend to be small companies and advertising, and it's not even the main companies, it's the secondary and tertiary companies. So, you know, you can deal with that. There's ways to, you know, tamp that down and pull it back. It's hard, but you can do it. But once the big guys get out of the bag, then we're in trouble. So we need to begin doing that right now. Fortunately, the regulators are all about that. I mean, the Federal Trade Commission, the new, new Justice Commissioner, even people from the Central Committee in China are concerned about what their companies are doing to their citizens. So, you know, there's pretty broad concern about this, which I think bodes well. But we have to actually get stuff on the ground and working now to work out the kinks, to make sure people know, to make sure it does what we think it's going to do. All right, we have a lot of questions coming in for you, Sandy. 
Uh oh, very popular. So I'm going to try to get to as many as I can here uh, in no particular order. So uh, here's one. Can we expect an increase in productivity in the future due to the Internet of Things? Well, I think absolutely. Um, the part that I'm most interested in is the Internet of Things where the things are people. Um, clearly, if you can make your cars work better and not break or your jet engines not break, that's good and that's productivity. But think about people. So the most striking example now are, are the navigation aids in cars. That helps us route cars around, makes traffic a lot better than it otherwise would be. And as that system develops more, you're going to get things like when you leave your house, it knows that you're almost certainly going to work or almost certainly going downtown. And what it will do is reserve a parking spot for you so that you know exactly where to go and park. What does that do? Well, that saves 30 to 40 percent of the gasoline spent in all in cities. Wow. That's crazy. 30 percent, 40 percent of the gasoline burned in a city is spent looking for parking. There's no reason to do that at all. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy, right? Yeah. And and same thing with healthcare, same thing with, with other sorts of things. Energy. Here's another good one. It says, please comment on what you think is a reasonable trade-off between convenience and security when it comes to personal data. Um, I think that there are mechanisms that are don't demand that trade-off. So for instance, the sorts of things that we're building are called organic biometrics. So your phone knows from your pattern of using it that it's still you. I mean, if you think about it, only you sleep in your bed, only you work at your desk, you call your mom or whoever you call at 7 o'clock every Sunday, whatever it is, but it's really very uniquely you. In fact, it's better than fingerprints. It's, it's better than face recognition and identifying. And you don't have to do anything. It's just your phone knows your patterns, so it knows that it doesn't need to worry that it's been stolen, et cetera, et cetera. So there are things like that for authentication, and then there are new ways of getting rid of passwords. Let's hope that happens quickly. <laughs> but like, for instance, um, a couple of years ago now, um, we discovered that the U.S. military had developed software called OpenID Connect that lets you get rid of all, a lot of the passwords out there. It's a way of propagating identity and tokens around. It's very secure. There's really no trade-off in terms of convenience. It's just better. And uh, what we need to do is we need to get the world to start use using technology like that so that we don't have to have those long lists of passwords stuck on stickies on our computer monitor. Solve the password problem to be a trillionaire. Uh, I like this one because it's that big kind of big picture question you love taking on. It says, if data becomes a form of revenue generation and a way to facilitate the increase of production of goods and services, then don't we need to update our way of measuring prosperity? That is a data GDP, for example. Absolutely. Um, there's the GDP is broken in many ways. So, for instance, the uh, efficiency gains, the functional gains of electronics are not caused uh, counted in GDP. The, uh, the stuff that we give away, the entire app stores, freebies, right, premium models, that's not in the GDP yet. It's this enormous revolution in terms of convenience, not counted at all. Um, accounting firms don't count data and knowledge about how things work as a valuable uh, asset of a company, and they don't count investments in collecting that data as a cost of doing business. It's all crazy. So yes, we need to begin updating all of the uh, accounting and, and management tools to take advantage of these types of things. And obviously there's a lot of questions about how to do that. Uh, one more here I think uh, we can take, and may maybe a couple more, but here's one. Um, how will business ethics evolve as big data gets smarter? And I'll editorialize there and say, or devolve. <laughs> well, I think that um, the model that's most likely is the one that people use for medical experiments and other sorts of things like that, where um, there are certain sorts of things you can do that have been reviewed and approved, and if you want to do something new, 
there are ethics boards that you're going to have to go through. And does that tamp down innovation? Well, it'll slow down some sorts of innovation, but it'll also mean that we're not going to have things that are major disasters. I mean, you can imagine having things like smart homes that, uh, that kill the occupants by just some accident, right? That the programmer never thought that you would do this. And, you know, so you need to have people take a look at it. It's going to be a safety issue. It's also something that if you think about cybersecurity, as you begin to have more detailed uh, data about where the people are, what they're doing, how things operate, that's the stuff that you really want from cybersecurity if you're going to attack a nation. You do this, you do that, you bring down the electric grid for the entire East Coast, then you, ex you know, so those things are, are really critical and we're just beginning to understand some of this. Here's a good one, uh, very succinct. Is privacy about to become extinct? No, that's what we're talking about here. Yeah. Is we're talking about making your digital self have the same privacy rights as your physical self. That's a, the easiest way to think about it. Is we have these traditions for your physical self. You go in the bank, they recognize you. You write down your your name on a piece of paper. We don't have anything like that in the digital realm, and that's what we need. Well, I think any other questions coming in, Nicole, or? I think this is great. I think uh, I hope people check out the Q&A I did with you, which covers some of this ground and other ground, actually, uh, in the spotlight in the November issue, uh, which also includes an article by Michael Porter and another one all on the Internet of Things. Um, and for the next month or so on HBR.org, we'll be doing an Insight Center on the Internet of Things, so expect more there. Sandy, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. And, and everybody out there, thank you very much for joining us, and we'll do this again soon. Good.